blitzkrieg of tornado information, except what we're going to do here is I want to get at the background stuff. Brandon talked about modeling supercells, pretty crude resolution. The point is you can't judge those forecasts if you don't have any idea what it takes to support a supercell or tornado genesis. Now, again, a lot of this stuff is kind of the best guess that we have going right now. I'm going to try to share, excuse me, the our best guess is the conceptual model for what drives the supercell, where the rotation comes from, and how that fits in with the environmental information. So the idea is that you can look at weather information and figure out, does this environment support a rotating storm? Will it be long-lived? After that, we can talk about tornado genesis. So I'm going to try to go through a bunch of stuff. Again, it's like Brandon's, you know, we'll have plenty of questions at the end, and I'm hoping that when you walk out of here, you'll have a better appreciation for what goes into the All right. Supercells. I assume everybody in here is relatively familiar with them. Since you're a chaser con, and I'm just guessing most people have seen supercells, just to make sure we're talking about rotating storms. Characteristic mesocyclone, it's essentially a rotating updraft. And we have research going back into the 1970s, late 70s, with the classic supercell model with Luna Dazza. So that was based all on observation. So at that point, we didn't really know how we got supercells, we just knew what they looked like. We didn't have all the fancy radar data that we have now. All right, so what makes a supercell? Again, what do you, what do you need in the environment to get a rotating storm? Well, you have to start with a thunderstorm. That, that's kind of the obvious part. You need buoyancy, convective available potential energy people throw around cave. Is there anyone that's familiar with the term? You know, buoyancy, cave, any of that stuff. Positive area on sounding. It's all the same thing. You have to have instability. We also need vertical wind shear. And we're going to talk about this in some detail, maybe excruciating detail. But that's the source of the rotation in the updraft. And I think it's key for you to understand what drives that rotation. Once you understand what drives that rotation, you can actually see how it fits in with some of the spear weather parameters and the forecast information. So you're looking at maps and it start, hopefully will start to make sense how you blend these things, the conceptual model with the information you have available here. Okay, what, why does middle rotation even matter? I mean, is anyone aware that a rotating updraft is stronger than a non-rotating updraft? It produce, when any time you have rotation in a storm, there's a low witness. It doesn't matter if it's anticyclonic or cyclonic. That, a left mover, right mover, it doesn't matter. The stronger the rotation, the stronger the low. What does a low do? Does air flow into or away from a low? It flows into a low. So if you have very strong mid-level rotation, what's happening below that level of strongest rotation? You've got a strong mid-level low. What's it doing? It's drawing air up from below. That makes the updraft stronger below that level of max rotation than it would have been otherwise. And that's how the storm keeps regenerating itself. That's why supercells are persistent. It's not just one updraft and gone. It regenerates itself. Another one that's a little bit more, gets into the kind of fuzzy physics stuff, it's actually more persistent. Rotating updrafts are more resistant to decay. Decay, they don't draw air in from the environment. They say show a little bit better. So that gives you a longer lift storm. Okay, so it makes sense. We've got a storm that tends to persist longer. It reproduces itself continuously. And the updraft is stronger, especially in the low levels. That becomes critical when we talk about tornado genesis. All right, now here's an illustration. People may have seen this. I got this up from a comment from Paul Murkowski at Penn State and uh, back in his days at OU. Anyway, this, uh, the, the idea is we Vertical wind shear creates horizontal vorticity. Everyone, if you ever heard the paddle wheel analogy, you stick it in there and you push harder on one side than the other, the wheel spins. We're thinking the vertical. We've got these vortex tubes, and what we're showing here is, in this case, think of this as like low level easterly winds that weaken, and then as you go along, they become stronger out of the west. And so if you look at what the air is doing, there's a tendency spin, you're pushing the top of the tube toward the east and the bottom of it toward the west, you have rotation about a horizontal axis. That's, a, that's horizontal vorticity, and we frequently illustrate it as these vortex tubes. Now the key here in this case, 
What kind of photograph would that be? Is that a straight or a curved photograph? Do you think? Well, those are all east of what else? Straight photograph. So this is kind of a special case where how do you get the storm rotation? I mean, does anyone notice anything about this? Where's the rotation with this initial storm compared to the updraft? Is it co-located with the updraft or is it kind of on the side? It's on the side. So anyone ever heard the uh, terms crosswise and streamwise vorticity? This is crosswise vorticity. This is a case where the initial vorticity is on the fringe of the storm. So this is not initially a rotating updraft, but what it's doing is it's redistributing what was horizontal vorticity. It's now rearranged it and you have vertical vorticity on both sides of the updraft. So you notice the spin will be one side, one side on one side. It'd be, in this case, it's cyclonic on the left side, and on the right side, it's anticyclonic. So that right there should start giving you a hint where this is going, a straight photograph. What kind of storms are you guys familiar with when you see a straight photograph? <coughs> storm splits. This is the initial stage of a storm split. The initial updraft, the rotation's out on the fringe. All right, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail with some of my fancy graphics that I made. And you will be able to tell at the end of this, I am not a graphics artist. Yeah. Here's my version of the wind profile. Again, think of this as east and west. These are east winds in the low levels. They switch around to west. No more south winds. So it's perfectly straight photograph. The spin about a horizontal axis would be like this. Again, you're pushing the further harder to the east on the top, toward the west on the bottom. Again, you put a paddle wheel in that, you would get a sense of rotation about a horizontal axis. All right, what does this look like? We'll go, what we're doing now is we're looking down on that updraft that we just showed in the video. So we've got the little sense of rotation that has been reoriented. This is the cyclonic or the left side in the example I just showed. That would be the right side. The spin is out on the fringes of the updraft. But again, what is rotation about a vertical axis? Is there a weak low with this? I kind of answered it for you. There, so. <laughs> but anytime you have rotation, you actually have low pressure. So the question is, how strong is it? If it's a stronger rotation, it's a stronger low. If it's a weaker rotation, it's a weaker low. In this case, it's a very weak low. We haven't really amplified the rotation. We just took what was in the environment and we went from horizontal to vertical. But what does that weak low do? It draws air in, right? In this case, this is a mid-level low. Where's it drawing air in from? If it's strongest, I'll just say it's strongest near 500 millibars. It's drawing air in from below that. What is that tendency to draw air in from below going to do? And again, this thing will just move with the mean wind. So we just got this cloud floating on the mean wind. These are my new clouds. You're initiating new updrafts in association with that area of rotation. So it's a weak low, it induces new updrafts. Now look at where they are. They're on the flanks of the original one. It's not moving with the mean wind anymore. What you've done now is we've created the right mover. This is essentially the birth of the right moving supercell with a storm split. New updraft is over here. Now what happens if you're moving east-southeast as opposed to east, is the vorticity purely crosswise anymore? Or has it become streamwise? If it becomes streamwise, that means it's not rotating on the flanks of the updraft. That means there's rotation directly with the updraft. Now the whole thing gets a positive feedback going. It amplifies vorticity immediately. It's not just tilted in the vertical, it's now stretched. So what happens to the rotation? When you stretch it, does this get stronger or weaker? It's stronger. If the rotation gets stronger, what happens to that mid-level low? It gets stronger. What happens to the amount of air you're drawing up from below that? It gets stronger. It's a positive feedback. The exact same thing happens with the left mover. It's just you flip the sign up. It makes no difference. So in this case, you've gone from just one updraft, a straight photograph, now we've created two rotating supersonics of opposite sign. They should look like mirror images. All right, any questions? I'm fine if we do questions during this. Any, anyone have any questions about the movie one yet? Or you don't care, or whatever. I mean, yeah. Last time you showed a lot of the uh, images of uh, radar, just look like the two of them close together. 
Uh, it could be, yeah. He would be asked if there were, on some of the other radar images with storms close together, were they storm splits? It could have been. I have to look at the atmospheric information. I'll actually show you some radar evolution and a real photograph coming out. That's almost the next day. So we'll, you'll get to see actual storm split and what it looks like with the wind profile. Okay, so we've created, and, and this is relatively simple. All this takes is we need deep vertical shear, we create low-level horizontal vorticity, we tilt it on the edges of the other graph, that induces new ones, and now we get storm propagation in two directions. All right, so this radar graph case, and we'll just summarize in words what we just did in the graphics. The storm motion falls on the photograph, so there's no propagation. In this case, with an east-west photograph, it's just a storm moving to the east. Again, initial updraft, updraft rotation is just on the edges and it's very weak, but that's just enough to induce new updrafts on each side. And then you go to the streamwise case, where now the rotate, rotation is directly co-located with the updraft, and that's what we call a propagation. And you'll see these things move off, you know, anywhere from 45 to 90 degrees from one another. And again, it becomes streamlined. So that's essentially how we create a supercell from a wind profile with no curvature in the photograph. There's no storm relative velocity. There's nothing to begin with. There's just a deep layer vertical shear. Okay, we're going to look at a real case. This is uh, from, I guess it was somewhere, I think it's Topeka, Kansas, so I didn't put the op site. This is, and it's actually going to be an elevated storm split. So this is an elevated thunderstorm that actually undergoes a splitting process. It's not even surface based. Okay, the mean wind I'm highlighting here, when I talk about the vorticity vector, anybody familiar with the uh, right hand rule? If you curl your fingers, if you point your fingers in the direction of the up, upward, and in this case the photograph, as you follow this from the bottom, you're going up in the atmosphere. The, the red is the lowest three kilometers, the green is three to six, the yellow is six to nine, so you're moving up higher in the atmosphere. So if you run your fingers of your right hand you know, up the photograph, your thumb points in the direction of the horizontal vorticity vector. So it's always perpendicular and off to the left of the photograph. So if you turn your hand around and your, your fingers are pointing off to the east-southeast of their own one kilometer, the vorticity vector is your thumb. Unless your thumb's messed up like mine, it would be off a little bit. It essentially points off to the north-northeast. So the vorticity vector is always perpendicular to the side. So in this case, if we look at the storm relative wind, again, this is just moving with the mean wind. The storm motion is on the photograph. There's no fancy propagation. This is not a supercell. This is what it looks like in a vector sense crosswise vorticity. You notice they're just perpendicular to one another. The vorticity vector is off one way. The storm relative wind is oriented perpendicular to it. And you'll see this makes more sense when we see the stream on this case, because it's the opposite. All right, so here's the initial storm. This would be that fancy puffy cloud. We've got, we're rearranging, in this case, the vorticity vector is oriented this way. So you'd expect the pressure perturbation, the little weak glow on each side. So on the northeast and the southwest side of this. And guess what happens? Exactly that. And remember, this is even an elevated thunderstorm. This isn't surface space. This is in the morning. I can't but if you look at this, you see classic left mover structure. This is a case where the left mover actually wins out. You know, the right mover is actually pretty sad. I mean, just a little sad thing, and it, die, it just dies right after that, so there's really no point. And when you get into the details like this, it's hard to say, in a forecast sense, you know, which one is clearly going to be dominant. Because you make just tiny changes to the wind profile. You add a little bit of curvature to the photograph, one way or the other, and it favors one storm over the and again, this is one photograph that we have at one point in time and space. This isn't exactly what that wind profile was, so things vary. It's, it's pretty complicated when you get down to the details. But the idea is the general rule holds. So you would have expected a storm split. We observed one. Okay, now what happens? You guys aren't here to look at storm splits, I don't think. And especially not left of first time. If, if you are, then you might as well tune out the rest of it. Because that's the last I'm going to say about an anti cyclonic storm. The clockwise curvature case, where if, you, if, you, if the hurricane photograph is curved in the sense of a clock following it around, that favors cyclonic rotation immediately. Because the vorticity is not crosswise, it's streamwise from the beginning. 
And again, we don't even need the propagation. It's an updraft moving with the mean wind actually rotates cyclonically from the get-go. And then the same thing, it's much harder to find the counterclockwise case because if anyone, if you followed any of the workshop stuff I've been doing online, the, the counterclockwise curving photograph, that's cold advection is what that would infer. And if you have a big cold advection loop, chances are you're not unstable. So that's a very difficult one to find. Usually it's the straight photograph. You don't see a curved photograph favoring a left mover, at least not in this hemisphere. Now in Australia, that's their normal one. But everything's turned around. Okay. This is a typical curved photograph case, no more straight thing. And we look at this, mean wind, again, it falls somewhere close to the photograph. Remember, right hand rule, in this case, your fingers point to the north, vorticity vector to the west. Look at the storm relative wind at the same level. It's aligned perfectly with that vector. This is what we would call purely streamwise vorticity. That means the initial updraft is rotating from the beginning. So there's no delay in anything. This isn't going to take long to show up on radar. And this is a very uh, typical tornadic photograph type structure. That sickle shaped photograph, some of you may have heard of it. All right. So what happens when you get storms developing in this kind of environment? Does it take a long time to rotate cyclonically? Do you think you're going to see storm splits? No. There's, because every storm, reasonable early storm motion favors cyclonic rotation. So in this case, these are just 10 minutes apart. Some of you might recognize what day this is. So yeah, But it's just 10 minutes apart. We've got a couple of other graphs, and we'll focus on that southern one. Not much in the way of rotation. Again, the storm's only been there for like 10 minutes at this point. 10 minutes later, strong mesocyclone and cyclonic shear. This is the pilger day. This is the very beginning, and that was the photograph from the Omaha sounding. Just to the east. So you would get the impression on the environment that storms are going to rotate very quickly, it's going to be immediately cyclonic, there won't be storm splits, and this is probably, with all the other environmental ingredients that we'll talk about in a little bit, being present, it should go pretty quickly to a serious tornado threat. And I think that, I see the picture in the back there, it demonstrates pretty clearly that it did, and it was more than one tornado. All right, supercell summary. We've got to have Caden vertical shear, the shape of the photograph is what drives which summer winds, if it's cyclonic or anticyclonic. The key is if we have a clockwise curve photograph, like I wanted to show, and the storms are surface based, cyclonically rotating storm immediately. Counterclockwise photograph, anticyclonic, but again, mostly you'll see anticyclonic with splits, where you see both of them at the same time with a straight photograph. So these are the two most common ones that you're going to deal with up here. All right, any questions about that? And it's important because we're about to build on this. If you don't get this part, then the next part's not going to work. All right, tornado genesis. Let's get to the good stuff. We need these rotating storms are important. I mean, it's not an accident that supercells produce the biggest, the baddest tornadoes, and they do it most consistently. But I've got a delayed gratification. It's always good. We're going to start with the simplest tornado genesis case, which will be the non-mesocyclone stuff. Again, it should be very familiar here. Any of the local chasers just sitting out by the airport, see this multiple times, and see a couple people nodding back right there. All we need, tornado genesis is pretty simple. You need a source of spin, and you need something to amplify it or stretch it out, the old ice skater analogy. Bring the arms in, rotation increases. That sounds easy enough. Well, with the non-mesocyclonic tornadoes, it is relatively easy. The problem is just can we observe what we need to see? Well, here's the problem for me as a forecaster for the whole lower 48. You tell me what kind of storm that's based at the surface can't possibly produce a tornado. If there's any little swirly at all floating around, they go Florida in the sun, the sea breeze. Where's a place? Actually, Tampa, right there around Tampa Bay, is one of the peaks in the country for tornadoes, just like right here in northeast Colorado. Do you think it's easy to forecast those, like three days in advance? It's like, oh yeah, I'm looking at the European model, or I'm looking at the herd with some simulated supercell. No, these, these are storm scale, little boundaries generated by storms, the sea breeze, but they have vorticity with them. And if you put updrafts on top of that, you can get tornadoes. Supercells, on the other hand, they create their own vorticity internally 
They create the stretching internally. So the storm essentially sets the stage for it itself. So the difference, not supercell, it's the external environment drives it. Whereas for the supercell, the external environment drives the supercell process, but the tornado genesis is internal to the storm. So we'll talk about the difference here, show some cases. Again, swirlies along pre-existing boundaries. The Denver Cyclone is a classic one. That might be the best known one in the world to get this source of spin, and it's just related to flow around terrain. The Palmer Divide, Southeast winds. Boundaries are also areas of convergence. Storms tend to form on boundaries. They just form randomly for no reason. They tend to be areas where there's air ascending in the low levels. And if you have enough spin and you have enough stretching, tornado. All right, now there's a classic picture of a non-mesocyclone tornado. They can be pretty and they don't necessarily have to be particularly attached. But the important thing is you don't see the classic supercell structures with these sort of things. And they're, you know, it's not just the dusty tube that tells you it's not a supercell. It's, there's, it's just the fact that you don't need a mesocyclone. You don't need a rear plane downdraft. All that stuff doesn't have to be present. All right, so what do we do? We try to forecast something like this or anticipate non-mesocyclone tornadoes. Well, we need spin. This is the, and these graphics are straight off the SBC Mesoanalysis webpage. This is, uh, the vorticity is the color fill. So if you look at the scale down here, this is kind of middle to upper vertical vorticity. So that spin about vertical axis, that means we already have rotation. And that's just where you have these north winds, south winds converging. So we've got cyclonic spin all along this front. Now the red contours are convergent. So we have air converging into and rotating right here. That sounds like an area where storms might form and they might rotate. There might be some way to amplify rotation early. Vulnerable lapse rates. Again, non-supercell, non-mesocyclone type stuff. We don't have any force to send. You don't have the mesocyclone to help you and to overcome anything that might be negative in the ground. So we want to see lapse rates. So in this case, seven and a half degrees C per kilometer. That's not dry to batting, but it's pretty steep. You don't want to see a lot of convective inhibition. In this case, there's fairly large K, 4,000. Looking at see this, this, yeah, the surface parcel. So 4,000 K, vertical vorticity, steep all of elapse rates, and it's on a boundary. So it, this is starting to sound like the classic non-supercell tornado setup. Okay, we'll jump in. Here's the radar. This is actually the front that you saw in the analysis is that western boundary. And then there's outflow with this convection. So what's happening is I'm pointing to where there's new updraft formation toward the southwest, where this outflow intersects the front. There's usually a lot of vorticity in a location like that, and you're forcing new updrafts. So you watch what happens if we jump aloft. The there's more reflectivity above this speck that you see down low. If you look real close, you can see what looks like a little bitty bounded weak echo region. That's a sign of a strong updraft that has just formed in this location. Well, low levels, initially, there's just very weak cyclonic shear, because here's the radar site, so there's weak inbounds, weak outbounds right in this area, but that's not very strong. I mean, those are like 10, 15 knot winds. You see a little bit, if you look real close, there is something slightly stronger, but it's a very small scale. This is much smaller than you would see with a supercell on the cyclone. And then look aloft, and you watch this, and we get this little, little swirly right there. And that little swirly was this tornado. Now, I'll admit, it is hard to forecast these things with any confidence. I, I should have put it in here, but I, in my infinite wisdom, I put out a severe thunderstorm watch for this one. So we did have big hail reports and we did have wind damage, but I thought, well, you know, what are the odds that anything's going to happen? Well, this tornado sat on a farm and ended up producing EF2 damage at the, well, the time it was out to. So this is back in 2004. And it's in August, so this isn't exactly peak tornado climatology time. But if you're not looking at the environment, you can easily overlook these things. So it's going to be subtle, and Kansas seems to be a favorite place for this, these sort of stall runs. All right, what limits non mesocyclone tornado genesis? Well, the first thing is you better not have cold, dense, stable air in the ground. So if the storms produce really strong outflow that spreads out quickly under the updraft, in trouble. Or if the storms move away from the boundary, that's where the vorticity is. So the swirlies are on the boundary, if the storms move off of it, you don't have time to amplify it to tornado or, Because typically you have to 
crank the vorticity up by about a factor of 100 to get a tornado. So the swirlies are pretty weak. So again, you want, what kind of situation would keep the storms on the boundary? Do you think it's normally a good supercell environment when you see this? What does the declar vertical shear normally look like in these cases? Is it weak or strong? How many say strong? How many say weak? Okay, it's weak in the weak shears. It doesn't have anything to do with their a mesocyclone being unfavorable or non-mesocyclone tornadogenesis. It's just supercells tend to move and they won't sit on the boundary. And I don't have time today, but I have some hybrid cases that are pretty cool that show a mix of supercell structures and they're on the boundary and you get all sorts of crazy tornadogenesis stuff where it's both processes acting at the same time. All right, now the meat and taters. The whole reason there's a chaser con is for mesocyclone tornadoes. This is the uh, same example Brandon showed, the uh, Mayflower Bologna violet tornado producer from this past April in Central Arkansas. This is just looking at the typical structures you'd see with the supercells form. This is low level reflectivity. You actually can see the some degree signature. Looking aloft, a very large bounded weak echo region. That just means that the updraft is so strong in all the precinct formation. They're just tiny particles. It's getting wafted out of the top of the storm before you even see. Sorry about that. Went the wrong. I thought I went the other way. But anyway, this this is just means that the updraft is so strong you don't even have time to get precinct formation there. So that's why the reflectivity is weak. You only see that with very intense updraft. On the uh, other side, you've got the uh, low level. That's the tornado signature right here. But there's a very large, strong circulation aloft that's co-located with this. So the tornado is this little thing. The mesocyclone is much bigger than that. The mesocyclone can be miles across. So this is the kind of structure we're looking for when we get the long lived in these tornadoes. OK, what is it about this storm? What is it about this kind of storm structure that favors tornado genesis? OK, one thing that's nice, we have a persistent updraft. That means we've got some source for stretching it is also reproducing itself. Remember, the propagation is related to the rotation. The updraft is constantly regenerating itself. So we always have stretching available. And that's just a function of cape and deep layer vertical shear. So that's what we talked about the first part. The mid level mesocyclone induces you know, the suck factor that's drawing air in strongly from below, and that's your stretching term. Again, it's the stronger the rotation, the lower the pressure, the stronger the end storm inflow, it's all related. This is the million dollar question for this one, is where do we get the surface rotation? Because this, in the case of a supercell, it's not like the non-mesocyclic case where you've got swirly sticking around already. The supercell is going to have strong rotation is a wall. Because if you tilt it and stretch it, it has to be above the surface. 
So the key here is just storm relative velocity by itself does not give you surface rotation. It gives you rotation just above the surface. Now, it's still very important because you hear, you've heard storm relative velocity and you hear updraft velocity with the other uh, high-res models. It's related to the tornado genesis problem, but it's not direct, and we'll talk about that a little more. Okay, the source for near, it's not storm relative velocity. The observations and simulations suggested that sorticity comes from the roof line downdraft part of the storm. So this is the hook echo region, the RFD part of the storm. We have temperature gradients, we're generating vorticity. The question is, how do we get that vorticity where it's not horizontal? We want it in the vertical, not 